Hi everyone, this is Liam here, back at it again with that EBA content as you well know. Recently I was speaking to the former head of technology from Innis, David Ventura, who worked on the original Owendon game and Elite Beat Agents. He was there right from the start of the series and stayed there through until 2012 after it was done. And in this video, I'll be sharing the parts of our discussion relevant to the series, in which he shares some insights from his time at the company, and some fun bits of trivia, including a previously undiscovered cameo in the first game. We also talk about his new game, which he has been working on for the Nintendo Switch, Hexagroove. This is a brand new music game made by him and other game industry veterans that was released on October 3rd this year. So be sure to give that game a look and enjoy. Like, what is your earliest memory of, of Owendon? Because it went through an, an interesting start to development. Like, I remember he was saying it began as kind of like an arcade machine concept. Uh, so right, I'm just right. wondering what you, what you can recall about the genesis of that project. Yeah, so at the time, I didn't speak a lot of Japanese. I spoke about no Japanese at all before I started working in it. So it, it, when we were working on Oenda in 2005, my Japanese wasn't fantastic. And I didn't know too much about the culture. So it was kind of like, I was, it's kind of like being like a kid in the room and hearing your parents talk and you see them getting excited about <laughs> things. And then you're like, okay, there's something interesting going on, but I'm not quite sure what it means and stuff like that. But like the concept of Oendon was, it took a while for, for that to all click in my head. But right. we had this really small office that was on top of a, uh, a, a beauty salon. And it was one room and you had like all the desks in like an island kind of orientation. Mm. Uh, so you could see like what everybody was doing all the time. It was kind of like, you know, having like a big family in a garage. And you're right, like the, the two graphic artists that were talking about it and bringing it up and... I remember when we started working on the Flash demo, I think, which also, you had some video of that in the GDC talk uh, that you were using in one of your other yeah. videos, and how that took hold. And then, for me, it was like, I wasn't really aware, I guess, if the company was in trouble or if spirits were low. I was kind of oblivious to a lot of the things. I was like, okay, I just got to, mm. you know, kick, a kick ass and do my job and, and, you know, crank out the build the world map and the, the authoring tools and things like that. But towards the end, I mean, I got, I got really uh, into it as it started to make more sense to me. I remember it was one time, I think right before we mastered up, like a couple of weeks or something, and everybody was so exhausted. And what I did was I had a green trench coat and I put it on and I put all my hair up with like, you know, mousse and tie took a necktie and tied it around my forehead and came into the office, you know, and be like, come on guys, it is a little bit more. We're going to knock this, <laughs> knock this project out. We're going to, we're going to wail it. And everyone's like, oh, okay, <laughs> you're crazy for it. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, from there, you know, Owendon came out and it was, I, I think from my understanding, it was moderately successful, but it, it had this strange second life in the West because there was a lot of people importing that game, you know, it, it, it really seemed to have legs. Was there yeah. any expectation at Innis that Westerners would take an interest in that game? I don't think so. It's, it's, the con it's so far out there, man. I mean, yeah. The, the local culture references are so deep and then even me being there and looking at all the time half the stuff that was in the game didn't didn't click with me <laughs> although although uh, I remember the last level that we made was the level that had that I think it was level four the song melody where they have the the summer festival the Matsuri right and in that uh, stage um, I have a guest appearance like I think it's like after the first third or, the, or after the second third there's you know like they're trying to rally everyone together and there's some foreigners they're taking pictures <laughs> of the the matsuri and i really really loved going i really loved going to matsuri and i really loved like the omikoshi the portable shrine carrying and stuff like that and that might have been part of the inspiration when they're trying to think of what to make the la the subject matter the last level mm -hmm. um but i show up i'm one of the there's like a there's like a foreigner that has like light brown hair and a long nose and very pale skin that takes a picture and that's like a caricature of me, so. <laughs> that, huh, that's, that's my, great. Me working itself into the game. <laughs> so, did you cause that to happen? Like, were you like, put me in the game? Or did the, did the other guys like, oh, let's just put David in the game? Like, how did that happen? I think they just did it. And I, you know, I didn't even know until after I saw the graphics putting in there. And I didn't, even, I didn't really oh. recognize it. It was me, to be honest, right away. But like their idea of me <laughs> versus the way I see myself is a little bit different. And then later I think at a drinking party, like, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's you. And they're like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> gotcha. So that, that's how you see me. <laughs> I finished my 
time in Ennis in 2012. And then I went on uh, a pilgrimage in the island of Shikoku uh, in Japan. So there's I have this, this one pilgrimage that this famous monk Kukai did. And if you walk the course, it's 1,200 kilometers, and you visit 88 temples around the island. Uh, and they say, like, you should do this. This is a good thing to do, like, if you're looking for answers in your life or if you have some demons of the past you need to get rid of and, and stuff like that. So I like being outdoors and I like Buddhism. So I, I, I gave it a shot. And um, while I was walking on this, this pilgrimage, I was asking myself what I want to do next with my life. And it kind of came to me while meditating that, you know, it's music is really important to me. And helping other people express themselves musically uh, is something that I've really wanted to do. And I want to learn more about music myself. So I, after that, I, I moved to Europe and started working for a music software company called Propellerhead in Stockholm. And uh, what I did there was I worked on mobile making apps um, so you, people could make beats and sing songs and stuff like that with their phone. And that was really cool. And I learned a lot about music production. And I, I grew as a DJ under that time. And uh, I made a lot of uh, good uh, friends and connections there. So when my time at Propellerhead uh, kind of went wound down uh, last year in 2018, I decided to form a company with one of my uh, co-workers there. And he uh, also worked at Propellerhead, but before that he made games. He made games for uh, iPad when it first came out back in uh, 2010, 2011. And we wanted to build a, a, a game where the gameplay was kind of procedural and the way that was not the same experience every time. And I really wanted to bring in my dream of giving people a chance to express themselves musically, people who had no experience with music, but had a desire to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of, we kind of glued, glued those dreams together. <laughs> um, and that's how Hexagroove uh, was born. So when the Switch had come out in 2017, we're like, this is hot, this is fantastic. We got to make something for Switch. So we started messing around with, uh, the, yes, with the, the dev kits and the, 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 went through a couple of prototypes. And then it was after 2018's GDC that we kind of had an idea that maybe this is something that, that, that might, might work out. So then in last fall in 2018 was when we started what would become uh, Hexagroove. And it took off. We got, we got really lucky. We had a lot of really talented people on board really fast. And now we have a game that's coming out in the Switch eShop uh, in just a couple days. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of welds together an RTS and a rhythm game and an action game. So the the thing, the games that I have in my mind that, that inspired it are Amplitude and uh, Top Skater. Okay. If you remember those those games, mm -hmm. so Top Skater was like a motion based uh, skateboarding game by Sega back in the mid 90s. Right. And you can like you know you stand on it, you can do like kick the board and do like kick flips and ollies and, and stuff like that. So. There's a big element in Hexagroove that's about showmanship and showing off and, and, and doing tricks. So we have DJ tricks, and that's the improvisational part of it. Mm. But the strategy part is about choosing pieces of music to come together. So we give the, the user these building blocks of music, and then they're allowed to put them together in any order they want, as long as they roughly fit the set of guidelines for how dance music should be. Mm -hmm. So every person is allowed to express, them, express themselves uh, in a new way but with the constraints of, of a game that says, this is good, this is bad, you know, this is working, this is not. Yeah, it's a very interesting and unique game. It's, it's unlike any other rhythm game that I've played, certainly. I'm trying to think of what I would compare it to. I guess there are little things that I could liken it to that wouldn't quite do it justice. Like I think maybe some of, like one part of the gameplay reminds me a little bit of DJ Hero. There's another that at least visually reminds me a bit of Thumper. I don't know if you've played Thumper, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the sections in the game where you are traveling down like a, a road of light and you have to direct. It's a, it's a series of very abstract mini games almost. Uh, between the gameplay of mixing together tracks and it's uh yeah it's a very unique experience w what would you say is like the elevator pitch to someone who maybe you know doesn't quite understand what it is like how would you sell it to someone yeah i would say that it's a strategy game for people that like music or a music game for people that like strategy mm -hmm. and it's for people who have had a dream of being a musician but haven't gotten there yet 
uh, maybe someone who played Winamp at, at college parties or they like to you know, take out Spotify at someone's house and set up a playlist and to control the, the mood, the room, yeah. work the room. So I, I think it's for people like that. It's not, it has rhythm game elements, but if it's not, not like uh, Musinks or uh, Sidus and things like that, where it's a super hardcore rhythm. Rhythm is a big part of, of Hex Group, but it's not the main part. So it helps people that maybe would be intimidated by it one of those hardcore rhythm games just want to kind of dip their toes into it i agree it's that's just one of the six rules yeah i agree i i definitely found it to be a lot less stressful than your average rhythm game there's a bit of leeway not that it's forgiving and i i i can just sort of play it uh, sitting on my on my sofa and enjoying the music and mixing it together so yeah, I would encourage anyone listening, uh, go try this out. It's I'm not just blown smoky. I have really enjoyed like the the two hours or so that I, I've spent with it so far, and I, I hope that people do try it out. Do you have any plans to say uh, put a demo out there? Because I feel like this might be the type of game on the Switch certainly that would benefit from a demo if people could try it out first and understand what the game is. Yeah, definitely. I think. A demo might be helpful. I, I've heard kind of mixed results on people saying like you make a demo and then it doesn't lead to conversion in sales or people skip the demo but then they don't play the game because they got you know one or two level, two or three levels there and things like that. It's a possibility. Mm. I can't say whether we'll do one or not but uh, right now our, our, our goal was to get the game out as quickly as possible because we're a very small company. We need to be, uh, need to be fast and we need to iterate. So I hope that uh, a lot of people can enjoy this uh, when it first comes out and we'll get some feedback and we'll look at uh, other regions or other platforms and or maybe some of the features that we had to to cut away we got some things some ideas in our head for expansions or maybe sequels and things like that uh, how have you found the experience of developing for the switch uh, i think it's been a blast actually as someone who's worked for consoles now for for three generations the tools have gotten so much better than than, than they used to and nintendo really has really up their game and developing for the Wii was tough uh, technically in a lot of ways like hanging the GPU and then not having a lot of debug information and there was a lot of like scratching the head and, and not knowing what's going on but these days the because the switch is built on uh, the same kind of tools that some mobile platforms are and it's got a, a graphics pipeline it's very similar to the other other consoles it's quite quite nice uh, I don't have any complaints about it at all to be honest was would you say there's anything in particular that informed the development of this game from working on games like EBA and Awendon? Yeah, I think that there's lots of there's lots of traces of, of things in those games, in these games. Kind of small hints of like tongue and cheek humor, of set of the idea of like a world map where you're progressively unlocking stuff with like these kind of uh, semi serious locations that you're going to. I was I was going to I was going to mention that exact thing. The world map yeah. reminds me a lot of Awendon. <laughs> Was that intentional? Uh, yeah, I mean that's you know what they say: start with what you know. And I've <laughs> been building I've been building those kind of maps now for what 15 years, so I <laughs> just like I already have in my mind roughly how how it's supposed to operate. Yeah, that's really cool. Another thing is the the, the game you were talking about that's similar to Thumper. I actually, when I designed that. It, I want it to be a lot like a Taruman, where you have a line and you're following it around. Ah, um, yes. And you're tapping at certain times. So the 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 trivia here is that uh, it was actually 2D during development. Like someone said, "Oh well, you know, a 3D perspective tapping game is better than a 2D perspective game." And you know, oh, okay, fine, we'll try that. So we had the, the tapping part was in 3D, but then the line was going to be in 2D. And they're like, "Well, why is this in 2D if the other one's in 3D?" And I'm like, "Well, I think that the, a 3D line driving game is going to be harder because you have you lose a lot with the perspective and like it, it can occlude itself and things like that." But we'd like, okay, let's give it a shot mm -hmm. for consistency's sake. And we just didn't have a lot of time. We worked on it. Like, this is not so bad. It's actually kind of working. So there's there's more interaction that I want to build into that part of the game that we didn't have time uh, this time around. So that's something that uh, that may pop up somewhere in the future. But that's inspirationally, that's the Guitar Man uh, part of things right there. Do, do you have any particular plans set in motion to you know, add more music to the game, more venues? So. Yeah, I think that's, that's something I really want to do and, and the platform, that the way that we've built it has made it very uh, relatively easy to do that. The only question is, I guess, like, what's the 
what's the business motivation behind that? Is it to sell as, as, as DLC or is it going to be a, uh, like an exclusive once we move to another platform or something? Or Nintendo does a really good job with these like epic amounts of like game as a service type uploads where they just keep adding more and more content over over the life cycle of the of a product like Zelda or Arms or something like that. But that's that's really difficult for small developers like us to do um, to justify that kind of cost. So yeah. we need to examine what what makes the most sense to help us uh, stay in the black. I get you. Yeah. Are there any plans? Have you considered? A physical edition because I know there are a lot of people who are quite stringent about that type of thing you know they they really uh, they'll buy a physical edition if one exists over a, a digital mm-hmm. one. I think that physical because it costs a lot more to produce is something that's very hard for indies to do yeah if we did do one it would be like a limit like there's a limited run I think company a couple companies that do that kind of thing yes um, but we would probably do that farther than line. If you look at, there's a there's a piece of software called Korg Gadget for Switch that Korg has done. It's like a, a, a synthesizer and sequencer. And that they were out, I guess, for about two years. Now they're getting a physical version, but the only reason they could pull that off is because they had a Kickstarter and got enough people to uh, to say they would put their money behind it. I see. Uh, so that might be something that, that's required to make those things happen, because it's such a big investment for the developer to build a physical version. Yeah, I, I, I definitely understand that. I just thought I'd ask because no doubt there would be people asking that in the comments i think yeah uh that anytime anytime an indie brings out a game like this that people find interesting there's immediately like a bunch of comments like well when's the physical edition you know right a lot of people don't seem to understand that you know it would cost a lot uh w- one thing that i wanted to mention by the way is great use of hd rumble in this game which is a feature that seems to be increasingly forgotten about as the switch's lifespan goes on yeah especially with switch with switch light now so it's that that you lose that unfortunately yeah do you think that causes problems for you were you aware of the switch light prior to uh you know making this game no we were not we didn't we found out about that about the same time that uh, you guys did but okay of course it's a music game we want to have the rumble be both as an aid for the user to know when they're supposed to do stuff, and then also as like a way to increase the immersion and make you feel like, yes, I'm in the club, I'm in control, and you know things are thumping based on what, what I'm doing. All right, so I hope you found that interesting. Check out Hexagroove. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, at Dr. Underscore Cupcakes. Don't ask me why it's that, it just is. And uh, check me out on Patreon if you like my videos. I'm patreon.com slash Liam Robertson. Thank you.